So uh, recently, well, I think it was about two years ago, the United Methodist Church decided that they were going to upgrade, update their translation, the, the common translation for the United Methodist Church. And so they got scholars together from various different mainline denominations, and they put their heads together and their work together, and they, they, they developed what is now called the Common English Bible, which we've been reading and we've been transitioning to. Now, we're a little late, and I have to confess that when I was a kid growing up and, and you'd experience the change in translation, which often happened in the United Methodist Church, probably every, what, eight to 20 years, I'll change the translation. Uh, and for many years, it was the Revised Standard Version. And then all of a sudden, it became the New Revised Standard Version. And now it's the, the oh. Common English Bible. When I was a kid, I remember going through that transition and hearing people at the church complain about it. How dare they move from that translation to the New Revised Standard Version? I mean, it's so hard to read. And I thought to myself that I would never be that person until now. <laughs> when I actually go to read the Common English Bible, the way they, you know, put the sentences together, the sentence structure, the, the particular words that they choose, they're different. So you might have noticed over the past couple of weeks that when I'm reading the scripture, I'm stumbling over it a little because it's not familiar to me. And I just became aware that I'm one of those persons who doesn't like change. <laughs> Anybody else wrestle with change? <laughs> now let me tell you something about that comment right there. Is that we always have heard in our lives that people have a difficult time with change. I don't necessarily embrace that completely. Because I don't think it's that people don't deal with change well. It's people don't deal with change when change is just dropped on them. Matter of fact, when we're invited into the story, when we're given reasons behind it, and we're gently invited to turn the ship together into a new direction, we handle that a lot better than we do if we just get it thrown at us. Amen? And so... We deal with change all the time. Amen? I mean, every aspect of our lives, in some way or another, things are changing. You don't believe me? How many of you have trouble getting out of bed because you're sore? That's a change. All of our lives are about change. I mean, growth and maturity as a person, when you're born to where you are now, you've changed a whole bunch. You remember when you were five years old? There might be some people out here who are five years old. Do you want to go back and be that person again? I know some of you are going, yeah, I want to be that person. I put my, head, my leg over my head, you know? Uh, no, you know, the person you were at five years old and the person you are now is a different person. You have participated in the process of change. Your whole life, you have been growing, you're becoming, you are becoming something different. Which I love that language in the church. I like the language of becoming. It was initially part of the early language we used at Cornerstone. We didn't say we were launching a new church. We said we were becoming God's church. That idea of becoming, growing, changing, becoming something new, it's deeply rooted in the Gospels. We hear it over and over and over again through Jesus and his disciples and when he shares with the people about this new beginning, about being a part of the new creation, about being involved in the new covenant, a new relationship with God and with humanity as revealed through Jesus Christ. This new thing was changing everything they ever knew about who God was and what God was calling them to do and be in the midst of the world. You see, in that community 2,000 years ago, they thought they had it all figured out and all together. They had a whole bunch of rules and ideas and beliefs that surrounded it. But Jesus came in and he just disrupted that whole thing. He challenged them to look beyond themselves and to actually live into a new day and to experience change which would benefit not only their lives, but the whole world. Amen? I mean, that's going to change. I mean, I even think about my marriage. My, I'm a different person now in my relationship with Leslie than I was when we first started. Love means something different to me now than it did when we first got married. Uh, when we first got married, it was hubba hubba love. <laughs> it's still hubba hubba love, but it's more complicated. 
<laughs> Not in a bad way, in a beautiful way. I've matured, I've grown, I've been transformed. The person I was is not the person I am now. That's good change. That's living change. There's no template for that. It requires us to live it. Do you hear that? There's no set of rules or guidelines. You have to live into it. Experience it. We see that in the gospel today. When Jesus has brought this man who's born blind. I love the text. There's so many little humorous moments, even though it was a long text to listen to. There's a lot of making mud in this text, isn't there? A lot of making mud. And what Jesus does is he heals this man of his blindness. He sets him free. But there are a few folks around that don't like what Jesus is doing. He's breaking the rules. He's participating in somebody's life in a way that they don't approve of. And he's letting them know that this God, this God who created all things, is not necessarily the God that they have created in their image. First of all, he heals a man. And second of all, they get disturbed because they heal the man on the Sabbath. Let me just break this down for you. This happens over and over and over again within the Gospels, and yet sometimes I think we in the modern church do not grasp it either. That we cannot control God. That we've been invited into what God is doing, into God's story. And God's story is rooted in one thing. That's that we learn to love. That we learn to love God and that we learn to love one another. Now, there is no hierarchy in that love. Matter of fact, in the Gospel of John, chapter 9, it says specifically that to love our neighbor is also to love God. And so what we've been called to do as a people of faith is to embrace this radical love and to share that love with the world around us by being just and generous Christian people. That it's a way of life and not a list of rules and regulations. And then guess what? This is the best part. That every time we go out into the world and we think we might have some idea or grasp of God, God's going to break that. He's going to change that. He's going to shake us up and put us back on our heels just like he did to the Pharisees. Now so many times we pick on the Pharisees and, and think, oh, the Pharisees, man, they were so bad people. How, how could they not possibly know? Well, I got news for you. We're just as pharisaical as they are. I mean, we have the book. <laughs> we know the story. Most of us who are gathered here today believe Jesus is God in flesh. Amen? But at that point in history, they weren't sure. And yet I hear in the life of the church and community here today in our denomination and denominations all around the world, people being critical of others, people being critical by the changes that they're experiencing. And they don't want to attribute those changes to God. They want to say they're rooted in man. But I've got news. That's exactly what the Pharisees believe too. Did you know there's a law against kneading? You know what kneading is, right? It's what the cat does on your back. <laughs> You are like, what is he talking about? Kneading. There's a law against kneading on the Sabbath. You know what Jesus did to the mud? He kneaded the mud. <laughs> Not only was he healing on the Sabbath, he was kneading on the Sabbath. How dare him? And yet Jesus stands there with a man who has great need in his life. He longs to be able to see. And Jesus is willing to offer him that. Yet all those who gathered around him that day who did have physical sight were blind to the truth. That God does not look just on outward appearance. is not interested in our spectacles, our rules, our belief systems. Let me break that down for you just a minute. Uh, Beliefs are subjective. If I asked every one of you in the room right now, what do you believe? Every one of you might say something different because each of one, every one of you are drawing from your experience. Belief and faith are not necessarily the same thing. I'm not saying that belief isn't important and it contributes to our faith, but it is not in and of itself the thing. The thing is the life of Jesus Christ that we focus on. 
That's in which we have our faith. Faith means to trust. It means to trust God and what God is doing in our midst. And then we have systems of belief that surround that. There were plenty of people around that blind man that day who were offering themselves in belief, systems of belief, doctrines, ideas. And I got news for you. You know the world around us right now? The generations that are coming up, which by the way, if you're under the age of 30, can you raise your hand? Please, please. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> if, you, if you're under the age of 30, raise your hand. Come on, do it for me. John. There's two or three people here today under the age of 30. The rest of them are too embarrassed to raise their hand. I have a little secret to tell you. As much as we'd like to think that there's some kind of strategy for getting those folks in the church, they're not coming to church. So thank you for those of you who are under the age of 30 who are here today. We're glad that you're here. Thank you for being here. Because the generations who are coming up, you know what? They look at the church and what they see in the church is judgment and a system of doctrines and ideas that they think are outdated and irrelevant because they're not able to see the embodiment of love in those things. What Jesus does in that moment with that blind man is he sets him free from his blindness and he invites them into the very story of God, which is deeply rooted in love. Not in all our ideas about what God should be or how people should fit in God's box. But he sets them free in that moment. To be able to live it abundantly in this world. The man says, I don't care what you think about this guy. I know I was blind and now I can see. And I'm going to follow that. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. These kind of these surprises erupt in the midst of our lives. And if we're not open to those moments, if we're not open to that way of love of God in the midst of the world that's revealed through Jesus Christ, if we're not willing to embody that way of life, but we get caught up in all the things that we think church is, then we're not going to effectively communicate this good news to the world and the generations that are coming up. It's just the way it is. Just the way it is. We have another story today in which people are experiencing this radical transformation and change. Experience something they never, ever thought would have happened. It actually begins in 1 Samuel chapter 9. The children of Israel, for those of you who don't know the story, have decided that they no longer want God to be their authority. They don't want God to rule over them. They want a king like all the other nations. Which, by the way, you need to read that text, especially in light of our world today. Because it blows me away that we would put so much into a human being. Regardless, this is a bipartisan statement, by the way. <laughs> Regardless of who the president is or who's in Congress or who's a leader in any of the nations of the world, that we would put so much faith in them in believing that they're going to make such radical changes that the world's going to change overnight. I've got news for you, it's not going to do that. Read 1 Samuel chapter 9, because Samuel comes to God and says, guess what? Israel wants a king like all the other nations. I can't believe they want this. And God says, whoa, 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 whoa. This is the best part. God says, let them have a king. And I have to believe in that moment, Samuel goes, what? What are you talking about? Are you crazy, God? There's a great little dialogue that goes on. But eventually, Samuel says, okay. And then God says, but I want you to warn them. And this is what I want you to tell them. That if you place yourself under the authority of a king like all the other nations in the world, they will take your sons and they will put them into the military. And they will take your daughters and they will make them your, their maid servants. You will be under their power and their control and their vision and their direction and it will not be good. And so it's been since the beginning of the world. <laughs> so that's the part of the story. And so Samuel does, and he goes and warns Israel, and guess what? They do get a king. And what's that king's name? Oh. Saul. <laughs> good, y'all jump in the head. You're ready, for, you're ready for the next one. This sermon is way too long. Let's get right to David. All right. Saul. Now, Saul's an interesting character is because Saul is everything you would expect a king to look like. If anybody Lord of the Rings fans out there, Saul is Aragorn. You know, he's t 
tall, he's buff, he's got a chiseled jaw, he looks good. He can take care of business. He's that kind of king. And that's exactly the kind of king that Israel wants. They want a militaristic king to take care of business for them, to protect them from all their enemies. That's what they want. And so God gives it to them. And Saul rules for a while, but then all of a sudden, this is an interesting part of the text, too. We can spend a month studying this part of the text. God says, I might have made a mistake. No, I mean, literally, it's in there. I'm not sure this was the right decision. And so he calls Samuel, the prophet, up, and he says, Samuel, I need you to go tell Saul that he's not going to be king anymore. <laughs> and then I want you to go find this other king. Now, a lot of people spend time on the text we're today on this idea of the anointing of David, which is important, as Lisa illustrated. <laughs> but I don't think the story is about David. The story is about Samuel. I mean, think about it. He has to go to a dictator who's crazy in power and tell the dictator that he's not going to be king anymore. <laughs> because God told me to tell you that. We know that he's afraid because when God says, you need to go find this next king, that Samuel turns to God and says, how are we going to work this out? Because Saul's going to find out I'm looking. And he's going to come after me. And that's the whole line where he says, hey, bring a heifer with you and stage this whole event that you're offering sacrifice to God. And then invite Jesse and bring your son. And so just to, you heard the story, so I'm not going to say too much more. But So they get to this point where they stage this whole event, the sacrifice. Jesse shows up and he's got his seven sons there. And Samuel looks at the sons and he sees the first one and he says... That's got to be the guy. And why does he say that? Because he looks like a king, right? He's buff. He walks without a limp. <laughs> For those of you who are visiting, I just had hip replacement surgery. So. Walks without. He can do a cartwheel on Easter. You know, all that kind of stuff. This is, this is the guy, man, who's going to lead us. And, and Samuel says in his heart, this has got to be the guy. And God says, nope, not the guy. Next one. Okay, maybe. Not the guy. Third one. All right, we're going down. No. All seven sons, not a single one. Not a single one. Samuel says, You got any more sons? Uh, uh, uh. And Jesse says, Yes. He's the little ruddy dude who's out watching the sheep. Now, I believe that this story is a metaphor for the church. Because I think we, as the people of faith, a lot of times point to that which we know or think is familiar or believe is what God wants us to do with people. We continually repeat that cycle and that wheel over and over and over and over again. Even when we have conversations about how we're going to reach the next generation that's coming up. And so rather than allowing God to lead us into new territory, into new opportunities, and to remind us once again that we, just like the Pharisees we read about in the New Testament, have become comfortable in our understanding of what it means to be church and what it means for how to worship God. That God is about to shake that up and he is shaking that up. And we can either participate in that, just like we were from the beginning, invited into God's story, or we can rebel against it. I got news for you. God's still going to move forward with or without us. God's kingdom is breaking through. The question is, are we interested in sharing and embodying this life of love to the world? Or are we more interested in our own game? Are we only interested in putting the people in place that we think that belong there, who we think might be the right king, are we willing to follow God's lead? Because the one that rises up who Samuel anoints is not the one anyone expected. Uh, mm. God is preparing us and preparing our hearts for such a time as this. God is calling us 
to walk and to step into this world that is changing drastically for the sake of the good news of Jesus Christ. To be an embodiment of love for the world. Not to be bound by all the things that we have thought to be so important, but simply to return to the thing which is the most important thing. Which is that God loves all of God's creation. God loves all of God's people within that creation. And God has called us to share that love to the world. What God is longing for is a church, a body of people, or a community who will be just and generous to the world. Not removed or isolated or separated. We no longer can define ourselves by by the violence that we, we participated in as a church over the centuries, but to actually step back and say our God is a God of peace and life and love in the midst of the world. And we need to share that in a way in which we build relationships with those outside the walls of the church. We get to know our neighbors, our community, the people around us. And I come to the end of the service because I'm not sure all the things God still has in store for us. Otherwise, I'd just end up being the one of the Pharisee, right? In other words, there's no real conclusion to this sermon today other than inviting you and me to participate together as a community called Cornerstone United Methodist Church to be a difference maker, to be the better place in the world today. And that doesn't mean just for other Christians. I'm talking about reaching out to our Jewish brothers and sisters and our Muslim brothers and sisters and our atheist brothers and sisters and letting them know we love them too, amen? amen. Because God loves them too. But that's not the message that the church has portrayed throughout the centuries, is it? Yet that's the message that God wants us to betray and to share with the world around us. It's what's going to make the difference. It's the direction God is moving in. And so this is going to involve lots of conversations and prayer and commitment to each other and to the work that God has for us. Which is why I've invited you uh, of different generations to a gathering on the next th couple Thursday nights called My Generation. I want to talk to you specifically in your generational setting. Not that I'm about dividing people up, but I just want to have that beginning conversation about what God is doing and who is God calling you to be. Because I think for those of you who are 55 plus, you need to start thinking about the legacy that you leave for the body of Christ. Amen? For those of you in the middle years, like myself, what are we doing now to best mentor the generations that are coming up behind us? How are we involving ourselves in the lives of others? And for those of you who are coming up who are younger, the three of you who are here today... <laughs> we want to encourage you to be bold in faith and embody that just and generous way of life in the midst of the world and we need to support them in that amen, amen. so I hope that you come to those conversations there are other conversations we're having in the church that we we've, we've surrendered to our idolatry of politics of red and blue I'm, I'm calling that out, by the way. It's a sin, the way we play that game. And we return in those issues into political issues rather than gospel issues. Bring them back. Let's, let's reclaim them. For what they are. Care for one another, the poor, the least, the lost, the broken. God's creation. The very earth that we love and celebrate, find beauty in, and put food on our table. We're having political conversations about those things, and we've surrendered that to the politic of blue and red. It's time to reclaim it for the gospel. Those conversations need to happen, and they're not going to be easy, amen? amen? But we can do it together, because we believe that God is doing a good thing. Boy, that's, I've gone a lot more than I thought I was going to go. Lunch is going to be 1.30 today. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not even had time for my story. That's wow. rooted in the in the title of the text. Oh. Who'd have thunk it? All right, I'm good. I'm gonna teach you Southern vernacular today. When I was in Roxburgh, North Carolina, there was a guy named Bert Denny. Bert Denny was one of the founding members of Cavell United Methodist Church, a beautiful man. 
Man, very few words, but when Bert said something, it meant it. He meant it. It was impactful. Um, but Bert was also a great healer because he'd find himself in conversations that were not necessarily the healthiest conversations in the community. Let me give you an example. When I brought a friend of mine who happened to be black to our church and invited them to read scripture, the rest of the church stood up the next week and told me that I should never be allowed to bring a black man into the church again. In which Bert Denny stood up and said, you don't need to sit down because you're close to hell. <laughs> Never said anything else a whole month, but he said that. And everybody sat down. <laughs> that means he changed their opinion, but Bert was standing up for what was right. He was willing to be in the bottom of the chest. And whenever something unusual would happen that was way out of the ordinary, nobody would ever expect, Bert would always say, who'd have thunk it? <laughs> And so Bert Denny, one of his jobs, many jobs around the church was, is that Bert Denny was given the responsibility for trimming the hedges around the church. Now this is a little teeny church. There's no more than 50 people at the Bell United Methodist Church. So there's not a lot of people to help get Bert out. And yet when you go to church, everybody in the church would say, we really need to find somebody to help Bert trim those hedges. Because he's been doing it by himself for so many years now. And I looked at him and said, what about you? Oh, well, I'm, I got I mean, I mean, a bird be out there, uh, and every time, you know, a month of past week, but we really need to find somebody. Help Bert Denny out with it. Come on, community, get out there. And one day, I saw Bert come because my parcel was right across the street, which I went out to actually help Bert, just so you know. And then I got poison hiding from my <laughs> toes because they were poison hiding. So I couldn't help Bert anymore. But I noticed that Bert brought a couple hedge trimmers with him a big cooler, and a couple boxes of pizza. And he was standing there eating the pizza. And I went back inside and did some stuff. I came back out, and next thing you know, it's Bert with eight kids trimming the edges around the church. And they did a great job. And the next Sunday, we got together, and somebody came up and said, Hey, Bert, uh, thank you so much for trimming the hedges. And Bert said, I barely did anything. And they said, what do you mean? He says, well, I had eight people help me. Uh, they said, well, who came to help you at the church? And he said, oh, nobody from the church came. All the kids from the neighborhood. And they said, really? How did that happen? And he goes, who'd have thunk it? <laughs> I think we find ourselves in the who'd have thunk it age. Because everything, we're getting shaken up here as the church. Not in a bad way, in a good way. And when we have those experiences and those encounters, <coughs> and they press our preconceived understanding or notions about what church should be or who Jesus or God should be, I think we just need to remember to tell ourselves, do the fuck. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.